In this lecture, I'd like to introduce the so-called Dirac delta function. And this function turns out to be very useful when we want to model a force that acts over a short period of time only. Okay, so let's suppose, um, suppose a force, and we'll call that force um, f of t, so it might be varying with time. So we have a force f of t, um, and this force acts over a time interval. So it acts over a time um, and again we're, we're going to suppose this is a small time interval but I suppose we don't need to need that right away so uh, t we'll call the start time t1 um, and the end time t2 okay um, then the impulse impulse produced by that force by the force is defined to be the following integral so denote the impulse by j you might have seen this concept in physics already um, but we're going to integrate from t1 to t2 our force function f of t Okay, and that's called the impulse produced by this force f of t. Okay, so what's going on here? Um, well, the sort of graphical meaning is, well, this is just, uh, if we have our force f of t, what are we doing here? We're um, taking the area under the curve. Okay, so... impulse is the area under the, the curve f of t from t1 to t2. Um, okay, so, so what's the meaning of the impulse? What does it sort of represent? Well, um, suppose our force is acting on an object um, of mass m. So if, uh, if, our, if the force acts on an object of, yeah, let's say, mass m, well, then the impulse, it represents the total change in momentum of the object. So it represents the total change in momentum. Okay. Momentum being mv, the quantity mv, uh, momentum. Uh, yeah, why is this true? Well, we can see it from the definition and from Newton's second law. So the impulse is defined to be, yeah, and the integral from t1 to t2, by Newton's second law, the force Induces a change in momentum. So it's a time derivative of momentum, mv. Where v is a function of t. Okay. Okay, well, what is this? We're taking the integral of the of a derivative, right? So that's the second fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, so this is just going to be m. Uh, let's see how to do this. Well, it's, it's v evaluated at t2, right? v is a function of t, minus m v evaluated at t1. Okay. And what do we have here? Well, just what we said. Right? This is a total change in momentum. Okay. Um, let's do an example of calculating uh, an impulse. So let's start with a, a fairly simple example. What about when um, when the force is a constant? So when f of t is just constant f. So when this is constant, what is our impulse? 
Well, we're integrating a constant, right, from t1 to t2, so it's just going to be that constant, f, times the length of the interval, t2 minus t1. That follows either by thinking about it geometrically or yeah, from the from the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, all right, so why is this a useful concept, the impulse? Well, when when you consider how a force is is acting on an object and how this force is going to affect the motion of the object. It's actually not, it's important not only to consider the magnitude of the force, right, but also how much time over which the force acts. So we could have a force of very large magnitude acting for a short amount of time, and that might be equivalent to a force of small magnitude acting for a long period of time, um, right? So, and the impulse is sort of a measure of that. Um, so let's look at another example. And... Um, just to kind of show what I mean here. So let's actually define a few functions. So f of t will be um, 1 when t is between 0 and 1, and 0 when t is greater than 1. Okay, so we have a force of 1 newton just for one second, and then that force lets up. Um, and then g of t, let's make it have uh, the value 2, but this force will only be acting for half a second. Okay, and then it'll go to zero. Yes, this one should be greater or equal. And then uh, h of t is going to be this force. So we'll do four um, for uh, a quarter second. You probably see the pattern here. And then zero after that quarter second has passed. Okay. Um, let's, let's draw a picture of this. So. I'll draw a uh, draw a fairly large picture here. Okay, so let's suppose um, here's my t axis, and I'll make one all the way over here. So each of these will be one fourth. Um, and then we have one, two, three, four. Okay, so what does f of t look like? Well, it's just one, and then it drops down to zero. So maybe I'll draw a vertical line, sort of just signifying it's dropping down to zero. That's not really part of the function, but okay. Now we're at zero. What does GMT look like? Well, that one is going to start two, but it only goes on for half a second, and then we drop down to zero. And h of t, might as well put that one in as well. That, um, that has a value 4, and then I dropped down to 0 after only a quarter of a second. Okay, what can we say about the impulse imparted by each of these forces? Okay, I mean, we can say any time, let's say the time interval from 0 to 1, but really, this is a time interval, right, for each of them, because in this one, where when t is greater or equal to one fourth, we just have zero. So as you can see, the uh, the impulse is one for each of them. Right. So all of these, in part, they're different forces, but they all impart uh, the same impulse. And what is that impulse? Um, it's one. Right. The area under each of these curves is one. Um, okay, let's take this example a step further. Um, so what I would like to do actually, is I'd like to model a force that's acting completely instantaneously. So even shorter than this one, I want a really tall, thin rectangle. Um, so that's the question, how do I model How do I model an instantaneous force? Example might be, well, let's say I have, a, what's our favorite example? A mass spring system, right? Um, let's say I have a mass on a spring and then suddenly I hit it with a, a hammer. Um, hit the mass with a hammer. 
So that imparts an instantaneous force. And of course, it's not actually instantaneous. There's some amount of time at which the hammer is making contact with the mass to push it. Um, but again, it's a useful model. Um, so let's, um, let's start by defining um, the function f epsilon of t. Epsilon is what mathematicians use for something that's very small, something that's close to zero. Um, okay, and I'm going to use this uh, as inspiration. So I want this force to act over a, a time interval of epsilon. Okay, some small number, epsilon. And, uh, and what should the force be here? If I'm keeping with these examples and I want to impart an impulse of one, it should be one over epsilon. Right. So my interval length is epsilon and my value is one over epsilon. This time this is one. Um, and then I want to be zero for t greater or equal to epsilon. Okay, so yeah, what does that uh, correspond to here? So th uh, this one here is, uh, is epsilon equals one. That's the first one. This one would be epsilon equals one half. Right, and to two is one over one half, right? And then this one will be epsilon equals one fourth. Okay. And you know, for, for any value of epsilon, for any epsilon, the impulse is one. Okay, what do we want to do next? Well, if it's instantaneous, then I want to actually take the limit as this epsilon gets smaller and smaller and finally goes to zero. So we're going to define, and this is actually um, the topic of the lecture. This is the Dirac delta function, delta of t. We're going to define this to be the limit of these functions as epsilon goes to zero. Okay, so the limit of f, f epsilon of t. Okay, so um, that's hard to imagine what this looks like. Um, as our width of the rectangle gets smaller, as epsilon gets smaller, these get taller and taller. But what happens when the width becomes you know, infinitely small? Well, and this gets infinitely high. Um, so, I mean, the best, the best you can do really is you can think of this, so think of this, uh, this function. Technically, it's not even a function in, in mathematical terms, but uh, it's, it's called a it's called a Dirac delta function still. Um, so think of this as um, as an infinitely high an infinitely high uh, spike, let's say, not even a rectangle really, um, at t equals zero. Um, but what can we say about the area under this spike? Well, the area of all of these is one, right? So we're just taking a limit of, you know, things that have area one underneath. And so we should imagine that uh, the area is still one. So with an area, it's an infinitely high spike um, at this precise time, but the area underneath it is one. Um, again, you might complain, well, this, this can't possibly be a real thing. Um, and it's not really, but it's turns out it's a useful way to model an instantaneous force. Um, and the other thing about this is it has a very nice Laplace transform. So that's what we're going to do now. But let me, um, yeah, let me just write that uh, this is called the Dirac delta function. This is the Dirac delta function. Maybe put function in quotation marks. But that's just what we call it. Um, Okay, let's take the Laplace transform of the Dirac delta function. Laplace transform of uh, this function delta of t. Hmm, okay, so. Well, what better way to do it than just to work with the, uh, straight from the definition. So our Laplace transform is integral from zero to infinity, e to the negative st times our function uh, delta of t. 
dt. Okay. All right. Well, what's going on here? Um, this, is an highly, this is a highly unusual integral. I mean, after all, you know, this this right here. This is only this is only non-zero at one point. <laughs> Right, because this delta function is just zero everywhere else. So it's zero except at t equals zero. And there's this infinitely high high spike. Um, so it's only non-zero at one point. And what is that point? Well, it's uh, t equals zero. Right. Okay, well then, I mean, we have this, this nice exponential function here, but we don't really care about that function other than its value at zero. What is its value at zero? What's the value of e to the minus st at zero? It's just one, right? But this is just the integral of the delta function. And what should this be? Well, it's one. Just as we concluded here. Okay, so, um, the, the, the Laplace transform of the delta function is just the number one. You might have been wondering earlier, you know, is there something that has a Laplace transform of one? Because remember when we took the Laplace transform of one, we actually got one over s. So we got something more complicated. Turns out there is a function that has a, a Laplace transform of one, and it's just really wacky uh, yeah, Dirac delta function. Um, okay, let's also... Let's also try to find a Laplace transform of, you know, remember what we did with the step functions is we, we, we would shift them. So maybe we want, we want to, um, we want our impulse to be uh, delivered at a, a certain time interval that's not zero. So how do we do that? Well, we just shift it, right? We replace T with T minus C. So we'd like to know how to do this uh, Laplace transform as well. Okay, let's again go from the definition. And we have the same situation here. We're shifting the delta function over by C. So this is only non-zero. Only non-zero. Because this delta function is just always zero except for that one point where T minus C is zero. So in other words, where T is equal to C at um, T equals C. Which means this function here, I mean, we don't really care about it at any other value because it will just, this integrand will be zero. So I can replace that actually with e to the, uh, let's see, I'm replacing t with c. So e to the minus sc times my delta function. But what is this? Well, I can take this out of the integral now. It doesn't depend on t. Okay. Well, what is this integral now? it's still one, right? Because if we shift this delta function, we're integrating from zero all the way to infinity, right? So at some point we're going to uh, going to cross over that value t equals c, and then we will accumulate an area of one. And so uh, this just turns out to be the exponential e to the minus, uh, c, I'll write the c first, e to the minus c s. Okay. Um, Really remarkably simple formulas uh, for such a strange function that we're starting with. Um, so let's uh, let's record these in our um, our book. So uh, first we want the Laplace transform of delta of t, the Dirac delta function. That's just number one. That's really nice. And then um, delta of uh, t minus c is e to the minus c s. Okay. I think we're almost running out of room here, uh, but I think we only have a uh, one or two more. Um, okay, um, let's go ahead and solve some differential equations. But actually, before we do, I just want to point uh, one thing out. Actually, I'll, I want to point out two things. So, so first of all, uh, we we sometimes we sometimes use uh, the notation. Uh, 
delta c of t, right? This might look familiar if you if you uh, watched the last lecture uh, to mean delta of t minus c. Okay, just a useful um, shorthand. Just like we had the unit step function u c of t, we used to mean u of t minus c. Um, also, here's a question. Um, what is the uh, antiderivative of um, of this delta function? So, what function is the antiderivative of of this? I mean, we know if we add this up from uh, add up the area under the curve from zero to infinity, we get one. But what function would that would that be? Well, let's try to plot it. So I'm actually going to include negative time on this graph. All right, I'm, I'm going to try to plot the antiderivative of delta of t. Okay, so let's say we start here, and um, let's say our value is zero. I mean, technically, there are infinitely many antiderivatives. They differ by constant. But let's say our starting value is zero. And so we're just flat here, because... So far, uh, there's no area under this curve. Right? It has the value zero for all negative numbers and all positive numbers, actually. It's only at zero that something happens. And then what happens at t equals zero? As soon as we pass over that point, even when we're at 0 0.0001, now we have accumulated an area of one. So we're up here. OK. And then we just stay at an area of one because this again has a value zero for all positive numbers. Okay, well, what is this? Have we seen this function before? So here's one. Oh yeah, this is our step function, right? U of t. And so these have a nice relationship. Um, between the two of them, right? The, the derivative of our step function should be the Dirac delta function. Okay. Um, okay, so just a cool observation there, um, but that can be useful. Um, I'd like to now talk about a problem uh, that, that will turn into a differential equation. So let's do a problem. And um, let's, uh, last lecture we did a circuit problem. Let's go back to the mass spring. So um, a mass of um, one kilogram is attached to a spring. And let's suppose we know the spring constant. Um, the spring constant is one, okay? And there's no damping. There is no damping. Um, okay, what are our initial conditions? Uh, so the mass, let's say, is pulled uh, one meter from equilibrium, from its equilibrium position. and released. Um, say we don't really give a force, we just release it. So it's released uh, from, from rest at, uh, at time t equals zero. Okay, okay then um, at, uh, at time t equals Let's see, what should it be? I think pi over 2. I want to say when it crosses the equilibrium position for the first time. We can see if I got that right or not. But uh, the time t, pi, uh, t equals pi over 2, um, the mass is struck with a hammer or a baseball bat or some kind of blunt object. And what does that do? It causes, so causing an impulse of, um, 
let's let's leave this as a variable. So let's call the impulse capital A uh, to be delivered to the mass. And what would we like to do? Let's uh, let's just let's just first find a formula for the ma for the uh, for the motion. Find a formula for the motion of the mass or a function. Well, okay. Um, so we have an impulse of A, right? That could have happened in many ways, right? Just like in this picture, all of these, and even this one here, right? This one here and all of these in the picture, um, all these forces impart an impulse of one. Okay. So, so what is this, what is this delta function? So, so think, we said what it is, what, how I think about it, but what is it, what, what does it mean physically? So delta, delta C of T, um, well, it's a force that delivers an impulse of one, right? At what time? Well, because it's D delta C of T, it's uh, time T equals C. Okay. Okay, that's how to think about delta, and that's how to use delta. So if you want uh, and to deliver an instantaneous force to an object, um, then you use delta to represent that instantaneous force. Okay. What would this be for our problem? So for this problem, uh, for our problem, uh, what, what, what is the force that we want to deliver? The force of the uh, hammer, <laughs> let's say. What is that function going to look like? Well, it's zero up until pi over two, right? And then we uh, we hit it with an impulse of uh, of a, right? So we we want a delta pi over two. That's our time offset here, delta pi over two of t. But this is a force that delivers an impulse of one. We want to deliver an impulse of a. So what should I do? I should multiply by a. Okay. So this represents the uh, what the hammer is doing. And okay, well, how is this going to figure into our differential equation? Let's write our differential equation down. Um, y double prime times the, the mass, right? The mass goes here, but the mass is one. Plus, I don't have a damping term. And I have k times y, but k is also one. So I just get y double prime plus y. What do I put on this side? It's the external force, right? So it's this. Okay, so that's my differential equation. What's my initial value problem? Um, y of zero equals one, right? I pulled it one meter from equilibrium and I released it from rest. I just released it, I didn't push it. Um, so y prime of zero is uh, zero. There's no initial velocity. Okay, great. Uh, let's solve this initial value problem using the Laplace transform. So let's um, take Laplace transforms of our differential equation. Okay, what's the Laplace transform of y double prime? It's s squared times the Laplace transform of y minus s times y of zero minus y prime of zero. That's just coming from that part. And then the Laplace transform of y plus the Laplace transform of y. And that's going to equal Okay, what is the Laplace transform of this? This is the first time we're going to apply our new formula, right? So the, um, the Laplace transform of delta delta of t minus c. This is also called delta. Uh, this is also delta c of t. Right, that's our shorthand. Is uh, e to the minus c s? That's what we worked out earlier. Um, so this one just becomes. Well, the a is a constant, and then I get e to the minus pi over 2 s, uh, pi over 2 s, like that. Okay. 
All right. Um, well, y of zero is one. Y prime of zero is zero. So I just get, um, what is it? S squared plus one times, so this one actually, this one is zero. This one becomes one uh, times L of Y. And then I have minus an S. I'll move that to the other side. So this equals um, AE to the minus pi over two S plus S like that. And let's go to a new page. And uh, we just solve for L of Y in the S domain, which means we're essentially solving a differential equation in the T domain just by doing this algebra. Uh, we will have to take the inverse Laplace transform though. Um, okay, I should think about how I wanna do this. I think I wanna split this up into two fractions. So I'll divide this one by the S, plus one, S squared plus one, and now I'll write it as plus S over S squared plus one. Right, because I have this over s squared plus one, so I can split it up into two fractions. Okay, excellent. Um, now let's take the inverse Laplace transform. And it turns out I think this is one that we can do um, pretty much straight away. This is a really nice one. Okay, so we have y of t, our solution is, what is this going to be? Well, I have some function, a over s squared plus one. Um, let's, let's just do some scratch work over here. I'll take out this a e to the minus pi over two s times one over s squared plus one. This looks like the Laplace transform of the sine, sine t. Okay. What is the effect of multiplying by the exponential in the s domain, okay? Notice that's that's rare, right? These are these are all rational functions. I don't see any exponentials. The exponentials actually come from these u c of t's, so they come from a discontinuous function in the um, in the time domain. So uh, I think in particular I want to use this one here. So I want to use. Um, Let's get some more practice with this formula um, because this is a tricky one to use. So Laplace transform of u c of t times f of t minus c is is what it's uh, e to the minus uh, c s times capital f of s. So I'm going to try to view this as capital f of s. Okay, this is capital f of s. Okay, well then the sine t is um this is little f of t okay but in my formula here I'm, I'm going i'm doing the inverse laplace transform right so i'm starting with this i want to write down this as my answer um but this is f of t i want f of t minus c which is sine of uh, t minus c and what is c in our example c is uh pi over two so t minus pi over two that is f of t minus c, okay? So what do I write down here? Well, uh, I have the a, right? And then u c of t, u pi over two of t, a step function that turns on at pi over two, okay? Times this f of t minus c. So times a uh, sine of t minus pi over two. Okay, excellent. Oh, and then what's this piece? This looks like a cosine. Right. Just uh, get that. Okay, it's so my cosine, a is one. So I just get plus uh, cosine t. Great, and that's, um, and that's my function, y of t. So um, if you've watched the previous lectures, you know I don't like to stop here. I like to actually ask, you know, what, what do we make of this, right? Like, what, what does this look like? What does the graph of this look like? And we can't really answer that question because we don't know what A is. Um, but maybe let's consider for a few different values of A. 
Um, and so the first thing to note is that, first of all, what is sine of t minus pi over 2? Isn't there some trig identity? So note, sine of uh, t minus pi over 2. So shift the graph of sine pi over 2 to the right. What do you get? You don't get cosine, but you get, uh, you get negative cosine. Okay, so sine of t minus pi over 2 is just the same as negative cosine of t. Okay, let's, uh, let's use that to rewrite this. So I'll put this cosine, I'll put this cosine first. Cosine of t, and then we just have, um, we have minus a times uh, u pi over 2 of t is times the cosine of t. Okay, which is... Uh, Oh, well, it's just one minus um, minus this times the cosine. All over it. Um, still, it's a little bit hard to picture what's going on here. So what I would like to do is um, write this in actually in in piecewise form. So I want to get rid of this uh, u pi over 2 of t. Of course, these, these step functions are very useful when you want to do Laplace transforms. Um, but when I actually want to graph it, I actually would prefer to write this in the two-line notation. So so that, what is this here? This is, uh, this is 0 when uh, t is, is, is less than or equal to pi over 2, or less than pi over 2, I guess. And it's 1. This becomes 1 when t is uh, greater or equal to pi over 2. Okay, so using that, I'm going to write y of t as two parts. What about when t is less than, less than pi over 2? This is 0, I just get cosine t, right? I just get cosine t. So that's the start of the motion, it just looks like a cosine. What happens when t is greater or equal to pi over 2? Then this activates. This is 1, and I get 1 minus a times the cosine for t greater or equal to pi over 2. Okay, and this one's kind of fun to, uh, fun to draw, so let's uh, see what this looks like. Okay, um, so let's say we're starting um, right here. Let's say this is this is one. Here we have two maybe, and negative one, negative two is down here. This is my t-axis, and we're going to graph y of t. Okay, what does the cosine look like? Well, we all know what cosine looks like. It starts here, and then it goes down uh, to here. So let's let's say this is our uh, pi over two. That's where a cosine first crosses the axis. So it looks like I got that right in the uh, description. Okay, and now at this moment, we switch to the second line, right? Because now t is greater or equal to pi over 2. Okay, uh, let's consider a few values of a, okay? What happens when a is 0, right? We're allowed to do that. So when a is 0, I still get cosine. Right, so um, let me maybe graph these in a different uh, color. So it just continues looking like a cosine. This is for a equals zero. Okay. What about when a equals one? That's an interesting one, right? One minus one is zero. So I just have the zero function. So what happens there? Um, I hit the hammer with exactly the right uh, force to stop the motion entirely, right? It's not moving at all. It's just staying at position zero. So that'd be what A equals one looks like. What about A equals two? Okay, well then I get um, negative cosine of T. What does negative cosine of t look? I'll, I'll, I'll graph the first part over here. 
So now, now is the part where I actually have to I have to draw it. Um, so it's going to look like this. Interesting. So we followed a motion, right? This is the motion. I go to, down to zero, and then this is where I hit with the hammer, and it, it sort of hits me back in the same direction, right? So this is a equals two. Then a equals three. That will get me going even further. Can we talk about what, what would happen if a equals negative one? What would that mean? It would mean I'm going in the, um, I'm hitting it, I'm hitting it in the op in, in the opposite direction, uh, as as where it started, right? So I'm actually causing it to, um, well, I mean, let's not speculate. When a equals one, this is one minus negative one. It's two cosine t. That's actually going to look like this, and then here, continue in this direction. So this would be a equals negative one. So these are all uh, all possible um, graphs of the motion for different values of a. Um, and notice how this step function appears uh, when we come back to the t domain, and that's actually typical for these problems uh, involving the Dirac delta function. Um, so that's all I'd like to say in this lecture, and um, I just want to say that it actually turns out that um, turns out that this delta function has a much deeper significance um, in the study of uh, differential equations. And, um, but, but we're going to need to actually talk about convolution first in order to understand that. And so that will be the topic of the next lecture.